Frank Luntz is a veteran communications consultant, poster, and best-selling author who now serves as the CEO of The Word Doctors. His latest book is called What Americans Really Want, Really, The Truth About Our Hopes, Dreams, and Fears. Frank, nice to have you on the program. It's a pleasure, man. Let me start by asking for me the obvious question, at least, which is, do Americans know what they really want? Because I could spend a half an hour debating you that I'm not even sure that we know what we want, um, given a litany of things, but I digress on that point. Do we know what we want? We know what we want. The problem is that we're hypocrites, mm -hmm. to be blunt. Oh, okay. Which yeah. is that we want, we want things that are competing against each other. Mm -hmm. We want government services, but we don't want to pay the taxes. We want the right to choose everything from health care to automobiles, but we want someone else to help us make those choices. We are, we're a conundrum of a population that has so many internal conflicts, and I think that's one of the reasons why we're so frustrated right now. We want so many things, and we can't get it all. These internal conflicts are based upon what? A lot of it's based on government. Mm -hmm. There really is, really is hostility towards Washington right now. There really is hostility towards Wall Street. And people who, I'm sure some of them will watch the show, who make millions of dollars at the same time that they're laying off thousands of workers. And there's hostility towards Hollywood and towards culture. We just feel like we're losing control. And the reason why I wrote this is that I wanted to set the record straight about where we actually stand in 2009, what we actually believe so that others can't interpret it. There's not some angry mob out there. They are angry. And sometimes they, their anger boils over. But 2% of Americans are, and I quote, mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore, unquote. We've never had that degree of anger in this country. If, how, how can 72% of Americans be mad when they just overwhelmingly elected a guy who they were very happy about? Because he was running on a platform of change, mm -hmm. and he ran a very good campaign, and he's very articulate. When he speaks, we listen up to a point. Mm -hmm. He's been speaking an awful lot recently, and each time he speaks, it's almost like penicillin. It has a smaller and smaller impact. And what he's proposing, we now know about. And while we want change, and we still do, we want reform, we don't necessarily want Washington to be as, Washington to be as big as he is proposing. A health care plan. We all agree that health care needs to be reformed. It needs to be fixed. But we don't all agree on having Washington take a greater role. We all agree that people need to save their jobs. But we don't necessarily agree that we should be spending billions of dollars on some of America's biggest corporations. And the hardworking average middle class voter now sees all this and says, my God, what does this mean for my kids? One more statistic. Only 33% of Americans believe that their children will have a better quality of life than them when they get to be their age. A moment ago when you ran your litany um, and you kept referring to we, as I listened to the points that you were making, and obviously it varies and depends on the point that you're making, but I'm not so sure that I understand who that we is because some of, some of us we are upset about things that the other of us we ain't upset about. Right. Uh, there, there, there's no universal we here except we the people, but that's about where that we stops as far as I'm concerned. But what happens is the so-called silent majority is no longer silent, mm -hmm. and it certainly is a majority. We surveyed 6,400 people for this book. Mm -hmm. 6,400, the average survey is 1,000. In the last 15 years, I've interviewed more than a million people through telephone and email. So I have a good idea of what the public thinks. And on many of these issues, it cuts across age, gender, income, education, geography, ethnicity. There is a fear for the future that exists within every community. People are afraid that their children will not have it as well as them. Mm -hmm. They're afraid that their country won't be as good as it is tomorrow. And it's making all Americans angry. And then the purpose of what Americans really want, really, is to point those things out so we can solve it. So we can stop complaining about the conditions that we're in and figure out ways to address it. What do you think, though? I hear your point about anger. Um, and, again, we could debate what we mean by anger. But the question is... What do you make of how that anger, to use your word, has played itself out over the last few months? These town hall meetings, people showing up with guns, et cetera, et cetera. What do you make of how that anger, as you put it, is playing itself out? A couple things that will surprise people. Number one, it's not, it's not partisan. Some of the uh, significant percentage of the people who are coming are independents who don't like Republicans and are, in fact, are even angry at Republicans because they expected more from the GOP, point one. Point two is that it's happening all across the country every state, every region. It's not just the Northeast or the South or the Pacific states, everywhere. And number three is that some people get carried away.
but that's because they don't see an outlet. They don't see any avenue to bring about change. We've seen it in so many different communities over the last 40 years. When people can't make a difference, they resort to either language or tactics that is anti-civil and anti-social. The purpose of trying to capture what we really think is to keep it on a civil plane so that we can at least talk to each other. Uh, you and I have had some great political conversations, and we probably disagree more than we agree. But we, there's always shaking of hands when we leave. There's always an, an we'll, essence. We'll, we'll see. You ain't left yet. Have his respect. Well, that's, that's okay. Right. Then I'm going to hold yeah, this right. just in case. I'm going to hold this just in case. Then. And probably you're a better shot than I'm, I am. I'm not a pacifist. I can tell you that. Although I believe in nonviolence. Uh, that might sound funny, but it's not really. Anyway, um, on a serious note, though. We, 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 we can talk. dialogue back and forth. Right. The problem that I'm having, and you've got all these politicians now, these members of Congress and the senators, that are canceling town hall meetings because they say they don't want to get yelled at. Well, then how does a constituent hold their elected official accountable if not for the town hall meeting? How do we hold Wall Street accountable if not for these open shareholder meetings? I think this is such a good sign for democracy that for the first time people are actually participating in more than just an election. For the first time they're coming out and saying, I like this and I don't like this. I think it's great for American society. I just wish more people were listening and they weren't so insulting of these people who come. I agree with you on that point. Here's what I would challenge you on the former part. Um, I lived through, as you did live through uh, as well, the, the Ronald Reagan years. As you said earlier, we could de we could de agree to disagree, but certainly in the community that I came that I come from, the African American community, we were decimated by those eight years of Ronald Reagan. The same could be said of the country at large, decimated by these eight years of George Bush. Just making an argument here. The point is that we have lived through periods of upheaval where people had tumult, where they were angry. Tell me a period where you honestly believe in your lifetime and my lifetime. We're not that far apart in age. Tell me a, a period in our lifetime politically where you think that the anti that the anti-social and the anti-civic behavior has become as ugly as it is against this particular president. Oh. Was it that bad against Bush? That bad against Reagan? I mean, I don't, I don't recall black folks showing up with guns strapped to their waist when Reagan was president. Or when Bush was president, I, 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 don't, I'm, I don't want you to get, I'm not going to let you get away with this suggestion but that I, we've I, seen this before, I, But we have seen this before. Tell me where. And Tell the me consequences where. of this were horrible. One of my great political heroes of all time mm -hmm. was Bobby Kennedy. And I believe he was a victim of this. One of my great political heroes of all time was Martin Luther King Jr. And he was a victim of this. We have seen this kind of violence. We've seen this kind of destruction far greater than what we have right now. Just go back to 1968. I don't even know if you were alive then, but all you have to do is ask your parents what it was like when cities burned to the ground. Mm -hmm. Cleveland never came back. Newark never came back. New Jersey still, with all due respect to people from Jersey, mm -hmm. you can still find buildings that are, that are destroyed. The Bronx in New York, places right here in LA, within what, a mile or two of this studio, were destroyed by anger, by violence, by viciousness. So don't tell me that this is the worst, because back then people were being killed for their political beliefs. At least we have some sense of civility. I'm afraid we're going to lose it. Mm -hmm. Please, I don't want 1968 again. I think that was the worst year of all in American history. Nobody you listed, uh, and obviously the, the, the obvious answer is John Kennedy was shot, and I'm not, I'm not uh, diminishing that. I, my question specifically was about this kind of pushback at a sitting president. People showing up. It's not rallies. Obama. Hold on. It's not Obama. He's and the by, president. And, and by oh. the way, I, I would point out to you, because it was your focus group, mm -hmm. what Obama said about the research that we do, right. it leads the back of the book. Mm -hmm. It is not about Barack Obama. It's about Washington. And Barack Obama has come to represent Washington. There, Jimmy Carter was wrong. Jimmy Carter has been wrong about a lot of things. He's been a good ex-president. But he just does not understand the American people. We are not angry at Barack Obama. We are angry at Congress. We are angry at the institution of the White House. Right, right, We're right, angry right, at right, Washington, right, D.C. Right, hold up. I'm not here. I'm not on the Obama payroll, as everybody knows. But you cannot sit here and tell me that we are not, that certainly, again, back to this we. No, we, all of us aren't angry with Barack Obama. But you can't tell me there is not a significant slice of the American public, given their rhetoric, given their language, given their name calling, you're contradicting yourself, given the incivility of their language directed specifically at him. He is being called names. He is being threatened. 400% the Secret Service security budget is up to protect this guy. The anger up significantly. They're mad at him. They're mad at Congress. They're mad at legislation. It's, it's not They're either mad or. It's, it's Frank. It's not either or. Because he represented 